Hey doing everyone, welcome back to NRL Fantasy Analysis. In this video, we're going to be going through a Q&A. So, ask some guys here in the Discord group to go through some questions for me. We have a little section in this group there for questions for me there. Uh, and this is the best opportunity to get your questions answered or you know, if you're asking them on the YouTube channel or in the comment section, then you should be getting them answered as well. But I feel like there was a few really good ones in here uh, to go through and, and give, us, uh, give us everyone a little bit of an idea on uh, you know, some, some strategy questions, obviously some player questions as well. But we're gonna start with uh, Scoop, who one of our mods in the, in the Discord group. If you do wanna join guys, I'll pop that link in the description below and you can, uh, you can jump into this Discord group. You can see on the side here, plenty of different section. Obviously, if you want a you know, quick check on the videos, I, I post it in there. Uh, each video I pop up. Uh, we also have different you know, announcements and stuff like that. But obviously, on, on game day is uh, the pretty important one where everyone can just have a bit of a chat. Uh, we have you know, the guys speaking about you know, each of their different teams or maybe some news from different guys on there. And then uh, obviously, things like injuries, late mail, and player analysis uh, will jump into those sections as well. But we'll start with the questions here. And, and Scoop talks about, you know, Stephen Critter, so Crichton, uh, being real cheap for his average, thrown around a lot last year, definitely a lot happening there. Had that really dangerous try scoring run we had the other years, he decent value uh, among the cows or a must have. I personally think he's probably one of the clear, safe must haves. This was asked before I dropped the, uh, the cash cow video as well. Definitely, I'd say he's a must-have in that center or wing fullback position. Either way, whichever one you want to go with, I think that he's you know he's definitely undervalued, and I, I don't see a, a time here where he hits his average or, or below. I think that he's definitely just going above. So that's an easy one there. Jeffro's got a bunch of questions, which are really cool. So, what are the best cash cows for each position? We've got that uh, in the cash cow video, but in terms of the best ones, we can we can talk about that. I didn't exactly rate them, but I say Crichton for, for the wing fullbacks, just on, on safety and his role at this current stage. And then you're looking at guys like Pereira, uh, very uh, savage if he ends up getting a spot, but I doubt it at this point. So while he's going to be thereabouts, but I'm, I'm projecting him to be better later in the season. In our centers on the cheaper side, I'd say guys, you know, whoever gets the the center position in the Panthers side, if it's only one person, I'd say probably Tago. Um, and I think Pedersini is going to be pretty strong as well. So they're top two there. Uh, if you're looking at hookers, obviously Randall at this stage, Beryl's going to you know, get an opportunity at some point. And just be aware of that, guys, when you're selecting um, your teams, that there's going to be a bunch of guys that are going to get an opportunity at some point. So if you do really like them, then it might be smart just to have them on your bench, for example. I, I'm particularly high on someone like Andrew Davey. So I feel like he's going to get an opportunity in that edge at some point, you know, on that edge at some point, whether it's you know, he starts on the bench or if he is starting on the bench, then that would show that he's probably next cab off the rank and he should be able to get an opportunity through COVID or injuries at some point. You know, we saw what happened last year and he actually got a chance second game to make that start before he got injured. In terms of our mids at this stage, uh, I did forget Josh King as well. So we'll pop him in there. But we just get did just get some news that um, Nass is going to be back. Uh, which is unfortunate for someone like King or Maria, Maria um, and also Jackson, oh, sorry, Jackson, Howarth, sorry, Jack Howarth. Um, for those guys, it's going to be a little bit annoying, but you know, you should see one of these guys get an opportunity. Uh, King's at what, 318k? So yeah, we'll, we'll pop him in there as well. Um, but in terms of our mids, best cash cow, at this point, there's really no one, and that's kind of the issue. I personally feel like we have to spend a little bit extra in the mids at this stage of the season. Just, you know, obviously someone might, a few guys might pop up in trials and team lists, but at this stage, there's not really anyone to look at that I'm really excited about. Hetherington, yeah, probably a little bit too expensive to be like a proper cash cow. In terms of our edge, yeah, I really like Davey. Obviously, bloor has been injured now. Looks like he's done his ACL, uh, un unconfirmed, and if it's officially done, but usually they're correct on that statement. Um, but yeah, poor Shawnee with that one. So he won't be on this list anymore for the season. Uh, but yeah, I like Davey. I think he's going to do really well if he gets that opportunity. But again, it's it's not very safe at this point. So that's that question there. Uh, who's the best secondary hooker for our teams? Obviously, we get a gun hooker, but who for our bench? Yeah, if you want to get your gun, awesome. But just, just at this stage, I'd definitely say Randall, I think, is the easiest one. And the cheapest. I wouldn't be looking too deeply into guys like Aaron Clark. I don't think he's going to be a perfect option for your side, a little bit more expensive. Obviously, guys like Cotter are going to be solid, but I think you should probably, if you're going to pick him, I'd, you either have him, uh, you don't go gun and you pick him as your starter, or you pick him up in the mids is my suggestion. Yeah, Paul Bloor. Um, Stefano Uitukamanu, uh, is he a good option? Yeah, I think he's going to be really good this year. I can see him progressing like he did in the back end of last year. He got a few more minutes. 
Um, it'd be nice to see how their, their pack shapes up, but for me, I think he's going to make a progression uh, into keeper status this year. You know, how high in the 50s is going to be, that's going to be the, next, the, the, the further question, and we'll find out that a little bit more through the season, but I definitely think he's got some value. All right, what would be a good plan if Cleary does end up being out for the first few weeks? Yeah, I, think, I feel like this is a really interesting question. And probably, I don't know, I, I, it could make, obviously, make, it would help with making your team. You know, will people go Tommy? Will people just go, you know, drop, use that 400K to, to spend elsewhere? And I think it's going to make a lot uh, teams a lot different overall. Um, but for me, if he's out, if they say, if they come out and say he's going to be out for, two, three weeks, I think you can't start with him. I think it's just too much money sitting on the bench and, and we know how important the first few rounds are. So for me, if he's out, you can't start with him. If it's one week, you probably sh you probably just need to start with him because it's really hard. The, the issue is it's going to be really hard to get that money together to actually bring him back in. When he's over over a million bucks and majority of the guys that you're, you know, you're starting with as, as keepers are going to be in that 650 to 700K range and a few mid-ranges and it's going to be very hard to one if they start really well, those keepers. You're not going to want to trade them out, for example, those 650 guys. Let's just say you start with TPJ and he starts really well. Are you going to be able to trade him out for for Cleary? And I think you, you wouldn't do it, would you? Like, and you're going to have to trade. You know, It might be three, four, five trades just to bring in an eighth. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when it comes to it, uh, for sure. Is Will Penasini a good option for center? I think he is. He's obviously young and has and is up, up and coming. So for me, he's a, a solid option. But check out that cash cow video. Uh, to go through that one. Is Rocco Berry an underrated center option? I think he's going to be pretty solid. He has some upside for sure. Dual position. Again, check out the cash cow video for that one. Who's better out of Kobe Hetherington and Aaron Clark? And this one I actually find really tough. Both at a similar price. Heather, Hetherington just a little bit less. My issue with Heather, Hetherington is going to be the role. So I don't think he gets that 50 minutes. If he happens to be a starter, then he probably will. And he becomes a solid option. Probably a little bit better than Clark. But if he's on the bench, I don't rate him at all. Um, and Aaron Clark has that starting position locked up, it seems. So he's a decent chance of making some value on his price. So at this stage, probably Clark. Hetherington has way more upside. If he happens to get a starting spot and there's a few injuries, then I'd be picking up Hetherington for sure. But as a starter for round one, I wouldn't be you know, selecting him. Best cash cards currently. Yeah, we've got that in that video. Who are some good pods? Really, really interesting question. Let's actually jump into the fantasy app. Um, kind of just been playing around with that, that team I made the other day uh, for the video. Um, just to kind of, you know, we have a look at maybe a strategy I'm personally thinking about. It is a little bit of an insight, guys, early on in the season, in the preseason, sorry, is spending a little bit more in our mids. I was trying to get, um, you know, a Cook or a, a Grant or something like that in the in the hooker position. I just couldn't spend the extra money if I wanted to get another guy in the mids because I'm really finding it difficult to find mid-range and cheapy options in the mids, for example. Edge as well. Apart from you know, a few of the guns, you know, we've got a lot of value in guys like Bird, Aiken, Burton, these type of guys that are just, just center jewels. So that's kind of where I'm sitting at here. But in terms of pods, I wouldn't put any of these guys in the pod range. Yeah, no, Pappenhausen is not a pod. Let's see how much he's owned by, 38%. Yep. Uh, in terms of pod land, <clears throat> guys like Cherry Evans are going to be pods for sure, but is he going to be able to hit that you know 70 average that he picked up last year? Um unlikely with the amount of kick meters he has. Someone like Fafida, I think he's you know, scored a lot of tries. Is he going to do the same? Maybe, but probably not. I think McInnes is going to be a very much a pod. You know, 7% 7, 7 of teams is not much for a guy that's averaged over 70 in the past. So he, I think he's a really cool pod to pick up if you're playing around. Marnie, I don't think he's going to be selected by too many teams either at 6% at this stage. I'd see that being very similar. Guys like Crichton aren't being picked up too much. I'd probably avoid Murray at this stage, just coming off shoulder reconstruction. In terms of other guys, there's obviously ones like Madison. Barnett's going to be a pretty solid pod, 1%. He always you know, performs, and he's got the dual position. Might be selected in origin, see someone who's very interesting. Thompson as well, that 54 um, score there. You know, can he keep up some big minutes? They do have a lot more uh, forwards this year that, you know, in Paul Vaughan, etc. that could help um, That could help out. I think Madison's really solid. I feel like at that 52 average there, he can really, um, really make some money off that. And, and improve on his scores last year. The worry with him is the head knocks. You know, if he can get back to that 70 plus minutes or getting 80 minutes solid on the on the on the right edge there, then I think he's going to be really good for your side. Someone like Fisher Harris is a nice pod who doesn't play play Origin. If you want to think about that stuff already, current I don't think it'll be a pod. Yeah, six percent for that dual position type of player um, is there. And then Adam Fennell Blake's going to be pretty solid, and he's going to be three yeah three percent owned. 
Um, Lindsay Collins is going to be solid as well. Guys like Cody Walker, I don't think will be too highly owned. Yeah, 4.7. So there's some guys if you're interested um, in having a little play around team there. All right. I've got the avoids out of those keepers with averages 40 plus for center, 55 plus for all other positions. So, whoops, let's go back to there. All righty. Let's start with the centers just to be make it easy. Cool. Centers there. In terms of guys at that top of the range, I feel like Katoni Sags can hit his average for sure. He's going to be playing outside Reynolds. I'm not worried about him. Burton, we're not worried about. I just, I'm not sure if Manu can hit the 48. I think Roosters being a better side, he's going to be playing strictly in the centers where he doesn't score as well as he did, you know, playing in the six a little bit, playing at fullback. So I can see him hitting a little bit under his average of 48. So losing a little bit of value with the dual position and stuff. You're not really going to go too wrong with someone like Joey. I think Dane Gay guy is going to be down a bit. So 47 in a Rabbitohs side was probably... Yeah, perfect for him and his gameplay, but when he moves to the Knights, they're not going to be as good. He's not going to get as clean ball. I don't think he's going to average at 47, maybe somewhere in the low 40 to 42 mark for him. Um, Rapana, someone who's done it before, so I'm not going to rule him out as a chance to do that. Avrilo, for sure, is someone that I don't think will hit his average of 48, even if he, yeah, he might even make the starting side. Um, someone like Zach Lomax, I think he has a little bit of upside in that you know mid range, but there's so many centers options and you know dual position guys like Bird and Aiken um, and and Burton for example, which makes it it's going to make it pretty tough for him to do really well. Um, yeah, that's probably it with that and the center side, and then we'll go to the full range of guys. And someone like Isaiah Papali'i is a very interesting one that I think is not going to average 63. I think he's going to be around that mid 50s. Still going to be solid, dual position, 780k. You're not really going to go wrong with him, but I, I can see other people with a bit more value for sure. Uh, other guys we're looking at in this one would be Cam Murray. I don't see averaging 57 at the start of the season, but I think he can get there for sure. Kiri, you don't need him to average 63 to have him do well at 750k price. You know that he's sitting around that 57 average there, uh, you know, being priced at. So if he can get somewhere there, I think will be solid. In terms of other guys that might be a little bit overvalued in this price bracket there's not too many which is good i can see the majority of these guys averaging what they do except for someone like Toa. i think see, see him coming back to the pack a little bit but still like about a 50 average i think will be good for him um, in terms of anyone else in this bracket i don't see too many more that are gonna really kill you do we if he's playing the centers won't average 55 for example but he's out for the first portion of the year and maybe someone like fogs i don't see him averaging 55 as well you know, moving to his new role. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with Connor Watson if he's playing sort of 40 minutes off the bench, you know, not averaging over 50 minutes like he did last year. Then I see him dropping down on his average and price as well. But other than that, that's probably it with that question. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, listening to a podcast the other day where they had physio on, uh, being a real physio, I'd imagine. I uh, wouldn't surprise if toes back around three or four. I'm stuck picking between getting him or see Charles Nicole Cookstar. Well, I wouldn't be selecting Tohu if that's what you if you're asking uh, if that's what you're asking, mate. Um, obviously, a Jacob Little fan, but yeah, for me, I, I wouldn't be touching Tohu at this stage. He I, he should be playing 13 when he comes back. You know, Curran will be locked to start, um, but I I wouldn't be banking on the fact that Curran will be 13 the whole time. I can see him moving to an edge. Whether it's going to be Curran and Aiken, we're not exactly sure. It looks like Aiken's pretty set on playing uh, on that edge for the for the season. So. CNK has his uh, has his you know pros and has his cons as well. So yeah, that's about all I can say on that one. Best value edge options if RFM doesn't start. If I'm being really honest with you, there's really not too many value edge options. There's you guys like Jack Bird, for example. Um, where are we going? Jack Bird and also uh, Aiken who have some value in that mid range. But if you're looking at actual you know guys that are in that mid range. You're not talking. You're not looking at a lot of guys like Luki could be there if he gets a start, for example. Eli Katoa has an opportunity if he starts, but again, if Toe Harris is coming back in around three or four, then you'll see him move back to the bench. Uh, we spoke about so someone like Tom Gilbert as well. I spoke about in one of those first videos that if he gets that chance on the edge and he plays big minutes, then he has an opportunity to, to build on his average there for sure. Liam Martin would have a little bit of upside along with Kurt Capewell as well, but again, not huge on their upside. And if we're looking down the line again, someone like Egan Butcher, if he gets a, a chance at a starting spot on that Rooster side, obviously you've got Gus and Satili, Tupanua. Uh, one of the, if one of them goes down, then I think he's going to be a solid option as well. And that is probably it around that price. And then you got obviously to the um, to the cheapy guys like Nainai 
and stuff like that if you're thinking about them. But yeah, not too much if I'm being honest on the uh, edge sides. Um, okay, yeah, the, if Cleary misses round one, is it too much money to have on the bench? No, I, don't, I think for one week's fine. No stress there. Uh, is having a keeper hooker as important as some people make it out? Uh, yes, that's TK on the Talking League pod. Um, it's good to see you guys listening to their stuff as well. I've caught up on all their potties so far, and then it's been uh, really enjoyable to watch. So well done to TK and the boys. Uh, yeah, who are the best people to get for him? I'd be keeping Cleary in his side if he misses round one for sure. Start with Grant, have him on the reserves for round one, or use trades to trade up to him a little, a little bit later on. Look, you could gamble on the fact that someone in your team is going to get injured or get COVID in the first week, and then you straight swap them to Grant so you don't really miss out. That's one theory. The other theory is you just, if you really want him in your side and you think he's going to kill it and get average in the mid 60s at a 678k price point, you know, 70k under, or you know, whatever he is, 70k under Cook, etc., then I feel like um, it's, it's fine to start with Grant. But if you're happy with one of the other start like um, guns in terms of Marnie or Cook or whoever you want to start with, then I think that's going to do fine to, as well. And that leads into the next question with, do you think Cook will have a bigger impact this year than compared to last two? I Well, it was the year before he absolutely killed it, and that's why I wanted to start with him last year. And I'm a little bit scared because I started with him last year and traded him out really quick. I'm definitely interested in starting with Damien. Uh, there was a you know, an interview with him the other day, and he said he's going to have a little bit more of a... Um, uh, or a little bit of a bigger role with with Reynolds being out. I think that'll be around leadership. I'm not sure if he's going to run the ball a, bit, a little bit more because you know their systems aren't going to change too much. But obviously he's going to have a little bit more of a uh, yeah, it's a little bit more of a bigger role. So I think that he'll at least score what he yeah you know, he's average fifty nine and a half. So he's at least going to get that. He has some upside as well. I don't see him going any lower than that because he's not going to you know start getting sixty minutes. So. For me, I think he's going to be at least the same, if not a chance to go better. But again, if you if you like him and you want to pick him, go for it. Go cheap in the centers again this year and jump on later for the guns or the likes of Bird and Aiken Bird going to change that. And we should start with two guns with at least one in center or, or, or on interchange. So I think you can play these guys in either position. If you want to go heavy on the centers and pick these guys, there's no issue with that. But I'd probably like, you know, with, with the lack of value options in the edges, I can see guys like Aiken and Bird being picked up there. Or you could have one of them down in centers and pick a guy like um, Panasini or Berry, those types of guys, one in the starting team, one on the bench. So either way is fine with that. Um, you're going to want to have probably those guys, or one, or two, you know, one, two, or three of them in your side at the start of the year just because I think they all have a bit of value. Um, and if that's the case, you're probably looking to pick up one or two more of them so that you get two guns or you're picking up another gun center later in the year. So yeah. There's a few things you can do with that. I wouldn't be too stressed if you're just going to go cheap in the center so you can spend money up top or a little bit elsewhere. That's completely fine as well. How many guns should we be aiming to start with? So if you're starting with Cleary, then it makes it harder to get a lot of guns in. If you are starting with him, I'd say six is plenty. So one in each position, hooker, uh, one in the mids, the edge, the halves, the centers being you know, one of Burton Aiken or Bird, for example, is, is a nice one to do. Um, and then one in the fullbacks if you're going Pappenhausen or, or wherever you're going. I think that's going to be fine. If you're not going with Cleary, you can probably have seven, I'd say. But for, for that one there, you're looking at guys around that, you know, anywhere from 600 to 800K for sure. Who are the biggest traps from the highly owned players this year? Um, well, we just have a little bit of a look at what we've got here. And highly owned, not too many in there. I don't think it's, you know, we could say traps at this point because we're not sure you know, if they're going to be on the bench, if they are on the bench and, and, and there's still 30% of teams owning them uh, and they're meant to be starting and playing and needing to play big minutes to go well, then they're probably going to be a little bit of a trap. But someone like Hetherington, I think at the moment, if he gets a, if he's going to be on the bench, he's owned by way too many teams, for example. Um, someone like Randall, I don't think he's going to be a trap. He'll probably do a little bit of a job for us. If he keeps the spot for a while, he's going to make some cash. If not, um, then he might have been a mini, mini trap, especially if you're only starting with him, just by himself only. Um, guys like... Clune could be half a trap, but he's you know he's when he gets you know a, a fair crack at the side um, and controlling it, he usually scores fairly well. To be fair, uh, in terms of our centers, I think someone like Arthur's could be a bit of a trap for sure. Um, guys like Tago, Penasini, and May all have some upside, so I'm not worried about them. And you look at the wing fullbacks. I don't think someone like Barry could be a trap. I could see him maybe only just improving on his average or doing really well and getting up near that 37 to 40. So, you know, it could be like a 32 to 40 range. So if you call him, you know, would you call him a trap if he makes, you know, 50K? Probably not, but that's that. Taft could be a little bit of a trap when he, you know, he's only playing a couple of games of fullback and he might go to the bench and then you've picked him up and he's not really doing a great job for your side. Um, and someone like Dunster could be 
but ugh, probably yeah, two two ninety eight. Can't really say he's too much of a trap. Someone like Kotrick, I think, could make a little bit of value, but to me, it won't get too much. And Sawali again could start really quiet, could start quieter, and then build into the season. I think for him is, is probably where I'm thinking. Um, Savage at the moment, you know, decent, highly likely not to get the starting one position, so he's probably owned by too many people, but it is what it is at this stage of the season. All right, last couple. Is Brimson worth a punt this year with him in the halves? I think I don't think he's worth a punt at this stage. I think you could think about it a little bit later in the season. He's probably a little bit too expensive to pick up as, you know, really he hasn't played too much six in his time. Toby Sexton's going to get a big role. Obviously, you know, a lot of people picking Toby up for that reason, that he's going to be doing everything, which means what's there left for Brimson to do? He has, he has to have a lot of tries this and a lot of tries himself uh, to do really well. So I don't think he's going to be worth a punt at this stage. And last one, any chance Simpkins or Tuolangi start over Garner? Yes, I suppose now with Sean Bloor out of the picture, I I just see Garner getting the spot, especially, you know, he can run a good line. He's fairly solid overall. I think they need a little bit of experience as well in this in this pack. So, you know, he he's comes now with you know a, a bunch of experience, which I think is helpful. So that's all I'll say on that one. I suppose there's a chance, but I, I don't know enough about um, the two guys to, to make too much of a, a comment at this stage. But that is all, guys. As I said, I'll pop in the uh, Discord link in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you are enjoying the content, please hit uh, like and subscribe. Really appreciate it. And we'll catch you in the next video, guys. We're going to be going through all the guns I think you should select, should select in your side going into round one. See you, team.